Okay, let let us start with the next session. And uh, the first speaker of the session is Dr. Gotcha coming from Turkey and he's talking about ICRS, perfect approach in complex large multiple stones with established indicators. Please. Okay. Thank you Dr. Lame for the introduction and I'd like to thank the organizers and Dr. Zin especially for this uh, invitation and organizing such a great program. And I'm going to be talking about endoscopy combined intraoral surgery. Uh, for the management of these complex stones that we uh, really uh, see a lot in our daily practice. And just to start with the talk, I'd like to present you a case. This is the 36-year-old male patient presenting with left staghorn stone, and he has a right atrophic kidney that has a 14% function in the EMSA scan. And uh, this is a young patient, a valuable kidney, a solitary kidney almost, so uh, we need to tackle this case uh, very precisely. And from my point of view, from the philosophy of surgery, actually an ideal surgical technique for us should be successful, safe, and fast. And uh, for the uh, stone disease, what we can say is an ideal procedure should provide us the real stone-free status, not with clinically insignificant fragments, with minimal complications and minimal renal parenchymal trauma, and also with minimal operation time and minimal hospitalization time and uh, actually a sup a mini ECIRS performed in supine position is the best option in my opinion to give us uh, all of these outcomes. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank these gentlemen that provide us this technique today. Uh, Dr. Valdivia, who introduced the supine position first in 1987, and then Dr. Gaspar Iberazua, who just proposed the use of retrograde urethroscopy together with uh, PCNL in uh, 2007, and Dr. Cesares Capone from Turin, who just gave us the terminology of ECIRS uh, in 2008, together with Dr. Gaspar Ibarazua. And later on in the presentation, I'm going to try to provide you the technical insight, how we do it, and what does ECIRS add to each part of the uh, successful operation. First of all, to start with the patient positioning, this is the, uh, our routine position, the Galdeca modified supine Valdivia position. What we do is we first of all mark the posterior axillary line and then put two bolsters, one under the hip and one under the chest, and just very slightly rotate the patient. Just five degrees is enough. I, I don't think that doing a, a rotation more than 30 degrees is necessary. And also we put the legs in the modified lithotomy position to make the uh, uh, retrograde access easily. And we, while doing that, uh, for the contralateral leg, it's adducted and extended, and the contralateral leg is flexed and abducted. And this is a real-time video, just about 40 seconds, that we give the patient position after marking the posterior axillary line. These two bolsters are put, one under the gluteus and one under the chest and just very slightly rotate the patient. And please keep in mind that we should not pull the patient to the very edge of the operating table because there are metallic bars there and they're gonna interfere with the uh, fluoroscopic view. And then the legs are just put in the modified lithotomy position. And by just the help of one person in less than one minute, we're gonna do the entire operation in this single position. And of course, the operating room setup is also important. Uh, this is a case that we're operating the left side of the kidney, left side uh, kidney, and uh, we have two surgeons, and they have both their uh, endoscopy towers just opposite to them. Uh, this one is the tower for the PCNL, and the other one is for the retrograde internal surgery. The C arm comes from the opposite side. Uh, and just, there is one scrub nurse, and he has, she has two tables, and she is just assisting both of the surgeons simultaneously. And when you have a tower like this, that you can, you can have a split screen, then you can have more available space within the operating room. And now we just take the uh, monitor of the C arm to the uh, same side, and again, just uh, one nurse is enough uh, in order to assist both of the surgeons. So to continue with the surgical steps, of course, our first step is, is, step is doing the cystoscopy and ureteroscopy and the retrograde pilogram. And uh, actually having access from the distal urethra to the most upper calyx is important during the surgery because we dynamically and endoscopically just see the whole collecting system. 
for example, they, we, we may see some very small tumors within the bladder or in the ureter. There may be some strictures in the ureter or some other ureteral stones, and we can just treat them in one session, in one setting. And also we can do the retrograde pilogram through the uh, working channel of the flexible ureteroscope and continue with the rest of the procedure. And after doing the retrograde pilogram, the next step is, of course, doing the puncture. We all know the puncture methods in PCNL. However, what does ECIRS add is the endoscopic guided puncture. We first evaluate the entire collecting system with the flexible scope and choose the most appropriate calyx for us to puncture that will lead us to the uh, dominant stone portion and then make the access under direct, uh, under direct endoscopic vision. And by this way, we can make 100% sure that we are in the collect, uh, correct calyx in the collecting system. And we can further proceed with the dilation and uh, sheet placement, again under uh, direct endoscopic vision, and this will provide us less fluoroscopy times together with maximal security. So this is another example that we did the entire tract creation under uh, endoscopic control. We are, we are making sure that we are uh, in the desired calyx. The guide wire is coming. And you can even take it out through the urethra if you need a kebab patient with the help of a nitinol basket. Now the dilator comes in and we just see it endoscopically very beautifully. Of course, this is not always possible because we are talking about complex cases. And in those cases, the stones actually uh, just fill the collecting system, fill the entire calyx. So you may not see the needle or the dilator. However, you can make sure that it's there because the stone will move still and uh, also uh, the irrigation fluid through the flexible uteroscope will distend the system and it will ease your access. And after creating the tract, the next step is of course fragmentation of the stones and taking them out. And in this uh, manner, uh, what ECIRS gives us is uh, the, we can treat multi stones from a single tract with the help of the technique of passing the ball. So this is the example. The right-hand side is the view from flexible scope and the other one is the mini nephroscope. Uh, we are operating on the right-hand side. We made a lower pole access and treat the stones in the lower pole and the renal pelvis. And then we have some other ones in the upper pole. And they are fragmented with the homium laser via the flexible ureteroscope. And then we take the fragments out of the system with the help of a nitinol basket from our percutaneous tract. So in one shot, in from a single tract, we treat all of the stones in the entire collecting system. So this minimizes the amount of renal parenchymal trauma and also minimizes the amount of bleeding. And this is another example. Again, uh, now we are uh, on the left side. Uh, this is a, a, a retrograde pilogram and all of the filling defects are huge stones. So what we do is we create the access and uh, then make here a 24 French uh, access and treat most of the stones in the middle pole and the renal pelvis. However, there are some other stones located uh, in other parts of the collecting system. So this is the way from the flexible ureteroscope from the upper pole. There are a lot of fragments. We are taking out, they take them into the renal pelvis one by one, and then take most, most of them with the vacuum cleaner effect. And some bigger ones, we just do some ballistic leutropsy very fast and all of the fragments are taken out of the system. Together with that, we also check the entire collecting system, the other parts of the collegial system for any residual fragments, and this actually avoids uh, just uh, one more tract in the upper pole that may lead us to significant bleeding, pleural injury, and anything. So uh, this, is an uh, this is not an innocent procedure, but still we just limit the amount of complications. And this is the end of this case, a lot of stones, and we did an integrate pyogram at the end of the surgery. As you can see, there is no problem, and all of the stones are cleared. So how about the scientific data? What does it say? This is our own data. Uh, actually, the aim of this study was to compare spine and prone positions for management of real staggering stones. In the end, we find that between the positions, the stone fear rates were similar. However, supine position adds us the benefits of First of all, we need less multiple punctures, less multiple tracks. We don't need intercostal, we, we need intercostal punctures less because we don't need, need those upper pole punctures. And also it uh, just limits the amount of bleeding together with the shorter operation time. And all of these three benefits, less need for multi-track, less need for intercostal punctures, and less bleeding comes from 
the simultaneous use of flexible ureteroscopy because it limits the necessity of multiple tracts. And at the end of the procedure, after clearing all of the stones, of course, before ending the procedure, we need to evaluate the collecting system for any residual fragments. This is one of our main problems because the stones can migrate to other parts of the collecting system. So we evaluated with the fluoroscopy, but we all know that it's not so uh, specific for detection of the residual fragments. It's not so, uh, I mean, precise. So we usually try to evaluate it with our endoscope, with our nephroscope, and in order to do that, we can either use our rigid nephroscope or we can use flexible nephroscopy. But in my opinion, in the modern and the urology, we need to have those flexible scopes always in our operating room, in our, always in our operating tables. Uh, and we can do this flexible nephroscopy either via the percutaneous sheet or with the retrograde access. It's possible for both, both options. However, in another study, we compared using the flexible, uh, doing the flexible nephroscopy either integrate or retrogradely and published our outcome. And this study, we have 137 patients, all underwent uh, ECIRS for complex stones. And in the end, in all of the patients, we did a postoperative non contrast CT scan to evaluate the uh, outcome of the surgery. And what we did was, at the end of the operation, we first made an integrated flexible nephroscopy through the percutaneous sheath in every patient, and then repeated retrogradely again in every patient, and compared the results. And we find that uh, in about 95% uh, of the cases with the retrograde access, we can navigate the entire collecting system, but it's not the case for integrate. In about 25% of the cases, we were not able to reach all of the calyces with the integrate approach because if you have a parallel calyx, then your flexible scope cannot rotate back and see that. Or even you see something there, you cannot take it out or you cannot laze it with that deflection. That's the problem. So doing the retrograde approach provided us seeing the entire collecting system and also we find uh, residual fragments in 18% of the cases. So it gives us also the opportunity to treat those residual fragments. And also we compared the results with the non-contrast CT scan and the negative predictive value for uh, retrograde flexible ureteroscopy at the end of the procedure for detection of any residual fragment is more than 96%. So if you did a flexible nephro retrograde flexible ureteroscopy nephroscopy at the end of the procedure, you can avoid a non-contrast CT scan in the postoperative follow-up. This is the main benefit. And this is how we do it. This is a 65-year-old female patient, uh, and she has stones in the middle pole and also a huge stone in the mid-ureter on the left-hand side. So in this case, we started with the retrograde ureteroscopy and just laser and pushed this stone into the kidney, then made a middle pole puncture and treated both of the stones. And this is at the end of the surgery. The middle screen is for the flexible ureteroscopy, and we are just searching the entire collecting system for any residuals. And this is the only way that you can make 100% sure that there is no residual fragments. So of course, this is a really nice surgery. If you have the opportunity, you can do that. But of course, there are some drawbacks. And most important drawback, of course, comes from the cost. Uh, the flexible scopes are expensive, not readily available everywhere. You need two towers, you need two surgeons, you need available space in the operating room. And it's really hard to do in the prone position. It's possible. The people in the American school, they do it with the prone split leg position. However, I mean, it's just doing something very easy, doing it in a hard way. So doing it in supine position is better. And of course, one of the most important problems is the reimbursement because we are not paid uh, separately for the ECIRS. Uh, mainly, we are paid for PCNS, so doing the uh, RIRS together with that procedure just comes out of the hospital's pocket. And in the end, I just want to go back to the first case that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. In this case, uh, we first uh, did a middle pole puncture. Uh, with a, a 16 French sheet. There are multiple stones in the system and they are just taken out with the vacuum cleaner effect. And then uh, there's the huge stone in the renal pelvis and we just fragment the stone with the uh, ballistic lutotriptor very fast and efficiently and take those stone fragments out. 
and most of the middle pole and the uh, pelvis is now free. And then there are some stones in the anterior calluses and we just use the pastoral technique to uh, prevent the necessity of uh, an additional tract there. And these stones are also taken out. But then we make the puncture to the upper pole, the second one, because there's a huge stone burden there. So what we did was a two tracks, ECRS, one mini and one 24 French tract. And we did the, do the ballistic lithotrips in the upper pole for those fragments. And these are all, again, taken out without uh, the need for any basket or any disposable. They, we are, they are just washed out of the system. And in the end, uh, this was a solitary kidney. And we tried our best to minimize amount of renal parenchymal trauma. And in the end, again, just evaluated the uh, entire collecting system with the flexible scope for any residual fragments. And in the end, uh, in my hands at least, this was the best that we can do. So to conclude, as I mentioned, the ideal sur surgical technique for stone disease should provide the real stone-free status with minimal complications, minimal parenchymal trauma, and minimum operation time. And in this manner, doing an ECRS in supine position, especially with the miniaturized tracks, gives us all of these opportunities. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions from the auditorium? Yes, please. Thank you, Dr. Gochi, for your excellent talk. Um, naturally, uh, combined surgery is uh, safe and fast for, uh, to get uh, clearance fast clearance of uh, bulky stone. Um, but uh, honestly, I think that uh, the cost is a very real uh, limitation for the use of this technique in a developing country. And second question, don't you think that uh, the use of nephroscope, flexible nephroscope, pro access sheet is uh, more faster and more cost uh, effective? then passing the flexible tool to Urita and using access sheet. Okay. Um, actually, from the uh, budget, I can say nothing. It's, the, it's there. It's an expensive procedure, of course, and it's the main drawback. But if you have the opportunity, then uh, it's, it's better to use it. And using the flexible scope from the percutaneous sheet, it's technically something challenging because uh, first of all, if you are doing a mini PCNL through a metallic sheet, I do not recommend to use your flexible scope from there. Because if you have a fiber optic reusable one, you will break it. I have done it. And if you do, you do so, use a single use one, it's better. Or if you have a bigger sheet, a, an Amplatz one, then use the, you can use the flexible cystoscope through your percutaneous sheet. It's a better option, and because it has a shorter flexible tip, and it's better to manipulate. However, the main problem is you cannot reach the entire collecting system with the flexible scope from the percutaneous sheet. When you do it retrogradely, and you uh, fill the collecting system with your nephroscope as well, then it's easier to navigate. The problem with the integrated approach is the collecting system also gets empty through the percutaneous sheet. You cannot fill it so that as it collapses, you, it's also hard to see the entire collecting system. That's one of the other problems. I mean, if you are using a, a nine French flexible vidroscope to a 16 French sheet, then the system will collapse. Your irrigation will not be sufficient. That's another technical point. Yes, Sanjay, please. What is the solution to IPI? Okay, that's a very nice question. Uh, honestly, uh, after I started doing supine, one of my main motivation was to do ECRS. And first of all, I kept it for the uh, challenging cases, for the multicalicial stones, etc. And now, for every case, I have the flexible scope readily available in my operating table. And my technician and nurse just asks now if I prepare flexible scope or not. It's not the question. Which one should I prepare? Reusable? or the single use one? That's the question. So I now try to do ECRS for every case. But of course, it's just an opinion, not, any, not a general indication. 
There's another question over there, yes. please. So it depends on the particular case that how we do it. For example, if you have a stone occupying the renal pelvis, a huge one, an impacted one, then so starting with the flexible scope has no benefit because you will not see anything. You just see the, see the UPJ and stone there, and you just force your flexible scope and you'll just break it. So instead, uh, we just continue with doing a standard perk. Like, and then after clearing the renal pelvis, if there are stones in the other parts of the collecting system, then insert the flexible scope from below. But in some cases, we have multiple stones in multiple calluses. So at that time, it's better to start with the flexible ureteroscopy initially, because some of the fragments may navigate from kidney to the ureter after your imaging to the operation. Sometimes it takes more than a month. So just evaluate the ureter for any of stones and then navigate the collecting system and select the best calyx that will lead you to the most stone burden and then do the puncture under endoscopic control if possible. So it just depends on the particular case. A question to Sanjay. You, Sanjay, who prefer the prone position, are you able to switch on to relearn the PCNL in shopping position to do this? The question I asked to you, the indication for the ECIRS. So basically you do when there is a multiple stone, right? Uh, I choose mostly, that is about 70% of the uh, puncture is through middle calyx. The reason you use flexible is to find the different calyxial stones, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go through the middle calyx, mostly these uh, kidneys uh, bearing with the multiple stones are hydronephrotic. Mm -hmm. When you enter from mid calyx, you can easily ins inspect the low pole group calyces easily without much difficulty when you use the midi PCNL technique, anterior, posterior, or inferior, very easily. So mini PCNL, when you do it, you can minimize the multiple cracks and you can avoid the ECRIS. Yeah, I could totally agree with you in this manner. I mean, uh, it's also our main practice to do a, a, a puncture from the middle pole. And at that time, you can navigate the lower pole and the upper pole, but not all the calluses. That is what I mean to say. For example, in supine position with the study of Mario Sofer that we saw yesterday, uh, you can navigate the upper pole through a lower pole puncture, but it doesn't mean that you reach all of the calluses. That's the problem, and that is what we saw in our study. The main concern about uh, ECRS is the addition of morbidity because you have two accesses to the kidney. We did not talk about the morbidity. Please, mm -hmm. would you tell us something about this concern? Okay. Um, actually, I totally agree with this point as well, because I personally believe that kidney stones are the disease of the kidney. So it should be treated through the kidney. I mean, passing through urethra, bladder, and ureter, it just increases the morbidity of the procedure. I totally agree with that. However, in uh, most of the cases, we also treat those stones with the retrograde ureteroscopy. Uh, and of course, it may have some potential to harm especially the ureter. And that's why in most of the cases, I avoid using a, a ureteral access sheet. But with those now, the tiny scopes with the 7.5 French or 8.5 French, we can do that. I mean, so it's basically, we should personalize the treatment options for every patient. But in the end, we should balance uh, which, is, what, which one is more morbid, leaving a residual fragment uh, behind or doing a retrograde ureteroscopy to treat it. I mean, we should balance the cost and also the benefits of these procedures. I totally agree about your comments. It's quite right.
I just want to clarify another point. I think we should not talk about the costs because our aim is the benefit of the patient mm -hmm. and not a cheap operation. Mm -hmm. The costs are associated to the equipment we are using, the costs for the operating theater, we cannot influence them. Mm -hmm. If we are talking about money, we should talk about the reimbursement, mm -hmm. not about the costs, because we have no possibility to change the costs. Yeah. And if we are talking about reimbursement, this is very difficult, mm -hmm. because reimbursement is associated to the particular country. I already mentioned, in Germany, um, ECIRS is impossible. If you do this, you can close your hospital after a few months because it is too expensive. Mm -hmm. Not too expensive, it is associated with less reimbursement. This mm -hmm. is the difference. How is it in Turkey? Yeah, actually, uh, there is no separate reimbursement for ECIRS, of course, and we are just charging the social security system or the insurance company for PCNL and RARS together. And it, depending on this, uh, their contract, they either pay for both of them or just for the PCNL as it is more expensive. So if, in that case, we are just paying RARS from our own pockets. Okay, Dr. Pa. <coughs> See, the basic thing for doing ECIRS, you have to pass the flexible scope through the infundibulum to the inaccessible tenants. So infundibulum has to widen, has to be widened. If the infundibulum is narrow, you cannot reach up to the stone through the flexible stone. And you have to do a mini PCM. Point number two, if the infundibulum is wider, since last 30 years, I have been practicing saline push technique. I will puncture the most lateral aspect of the stone and with 20 ml saline push, that stone through the wide infundibulum will come into the renal pelvis and in front of your big blast. So I have never used or never felt any indication of PCNLs. If the infundibulum is narrow, you have to make a mini PCNL track or a ultra mini PCNL. And if the infundibulum is wide, then why not push it in front of you? I will be showing in uh, some of this line push technique uh, in my next uh, lecture. If you follow that technique, there will not be a need of ECIRS. Yes, now we had a very long discussion about the indication of uh, ECRS, and now I have a question to the auditorium. Do you think that, uh, or, or I have to uh, say it in other words, are you in favor of ECRS, or do you think ECRS is not necessary? Who is of the opinion ICRS is not necessary. Please raise your hands. And who is in favor of ECRS? Yes, but where are all the other surgeons? Uh, don't they do any operations? They're sitting 50 <laughs> people. No, no. This is not a good this is not a good data collection. We should repeat this. Now everybody is really asked to raise his hand or not. First, who, 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 um, who thinks that ECRS is not necessary? Okay, and now those who are in favor of ECRS? Yeah, there's some more. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, so far as I heard, the um, order of the presentation has changed and yeah. your next presentation would be um, about the use of thulium fiber in RIRIS. Um, how will it affect the PCNL applications in the near future? This is the next topic. Yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much again. So uh, just to continue with the polls, how many of us in the operating room have available TFL laser in the operating room. Dr. Paul and no one else. So um, actually, TFL is a novel technology. And just to start with the EAU guidelines, we all know that we spare the PCNL for stones greater than two centimeter. 
and also the ones that we cannot treat retrogradely, the smaller ones, that, uh, that cannot be approached with, 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 through uh, the uh, ureter uh, with respect to the pelvic calcium anatomy and some other problems. So uh, today's question is mainly, does TFL will let us treat bigger stones with the flexible ureteroscopy? Is it the question? So uh, just to start with that, first of all, I'd like to give some basic information about the lasers, uh, the differences between holmium and tulium fiber. And this is the basic structure of the holmium yak laser. What we have is we have a flash lamp. It just emits the light. And then we have the, uh, the laser rod that's actually the amplifying medium. And it just changes the uh, wavelength of the light because there, there's an atom inside this amplifier. And the uh, wavelength of the holmium yak laser is uh, 2100 nanometers. And now we have uh, a lot of uh, high power holmium lasers available in the European and also Middle East markets. And they give us really very uh, nice properties. We, they can go as low as 0.2 joules to six, uh, as high as 6 joules of energy. And it can go up to 100 and 120 hertz of frequency with some devices. And we can really reach some long pulse durations with these holmium uh, yak laser devices. Together with that, we have some new generation devices that give us the ability of pulse modulation. This is the one uh, Moses effect from the luminous laser. And also we have some similars from quanta like the virtual basket effect. And these pulse modulation systems have some technical properties that give us to better dust the stones or use it uh, more efficiently for first state aniquilation as well. So in the end, a whole new yak is actually uh, in our, most of our uh, ours operating table, operating theaters now, and it's a very versatile laser. It can uh, aniquilate, it can cut, it can coagulate, it can fragment the stone, it can dust the stone. So it gives us actually all. So what does the difference between Holmium Yak and this tulium uh, fiber laser? First of all, just as a small point, the TFL laser is not the tulium Yak laser. It's totally different technology. This is a pulse laser. And now instead of uh, those uh, flash lamps, now we have the laser diodes and the light coming from these diodes are combined and then they are uh, given to an amplifying medium again. But this time it's not on the road, but it's a, a fiber. That's why we call it tulium fiber laser. And there are tulium ions that are doped into this fiber and then it changes the wavelength of the light. And it's about uh, four, uh, uh, 19, uh, 140 uh, nanometers now, and then it's just connected to the passive fiber and we have uh, the energy. So from the technical point of view, when we compare these two technologies, uh, tulium fiber laser is a smaller device, it's much more lighter, and it doesn't need a special electric supply. Uh, we usually use uh, 200 micron fibers with the TFL now, but it can go as small as 50 micron. It's an important property. And regarding the en energy range, the maximal energy is not different between the two lasers, but the minimum energy is much more uh, lower in the TFL. And in terms of frequency, it can go up to 2400 hertz, but of course we don't need it. Uh, and another uh, mo very important property is the pulse duration. Uh, with the high power holmium yak lasers, we can reach uh, 1700 uh, 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 microseconds in, in the holmium, but with TFL, the pulse duration is much, much longer. And also uh, the wavelength is different that I'm gonna mention later on. And also pulse shape is more uniform in the tulium fiber laser. It means that you do not have a peak energy that causes stone retropulsion or in, uh, involuntary fragmentation. So this is what we talk about the wavelength. And when we compare uh, these two, the wavelength of the TFL is uh, just very next to the maximal absorption by water. And therefore, TFL is four times more absorbed by water than the holmium yak. And therefore, the optical penetration depth is uh, higher for holmium. It's just lower in the tulium fiber laser. And this is the example of the pulse shape. The one uh, at the top is for the TFL. As you can see, it's very uniform. So uh, with the holmium, you, we have uh, some peaks, and this really causes the uh, better stone fragmentation. And sometimes it's involuntary, and that we do not want during RARS. 
So uh, for the differences in clinical application, tulium fiber laser gives us less peak power, less lower energy with higher frequency, with longer pulse duration, with a more uniform pulse, and of course gives all of these with a smaller fiber. So it is a better la laser for dusting the stones. However, uh, we have some technical problems with RIRS, and the question is, does TFL solve all of these? In RIRS, what we need is a fine dusting. It means that really sub-millimeter fragments, a fast dusting with high frequency, and while doing that, we need good irrigation because it will provide good visibility, and in the end, at the end of the procedure, all of these fragments should pass spontaneously through the ureter. It's our main aim. So does TFL solve all of these problems? Uh, actually, it provides us low energy, longer pulse duration, and a uniform pulse shape. Uh, so with the smaller fibers, we can have a good visibility. But how about the literature? What does it say? Now, the tulium fiber laser is in market uh, after 2018, and now it's, uh, we are um, uh, experience is growing with the flex, uh, with, during flexible hydroscopy with TFL. And this is a nice study, a prospective randomized study comparing PCNL and retrograde internal surgery for stones greater than two centimeters. Now it's the topic of today's talk. So, but in this study, the authors used Holmium Yak laser, and we can see that the operative time is, mean operative time is 95 minutes. In flexible hydroscopy, we usually try to limit our operating time less than an hour. So it's a long operation. And in the end, the stone free rates is about 70%. It's not sufficient. And together with that, in 13% of the patients, there's postoperative fever. So from my point of view, these results are not acceptable. This is not a treatment success. So a treating stones greater than two centimeters with holmium yak is not a good option. You will need multiple procedures. And this is another uh, study comparing the Ultra Mini and RIRS now. And again, the lithotripsy is performed by Holmiumiac laser and the stone diameter is one to three centimeters. And again, the operating time uh, for the flexible hydroscopy is more than an hour. It's again, not acceptable. And the stone period rates are lower than PCNL. And now in this study, the uh, incidence of fever is 22%, it's quite high. And this is the study by Dr. Chandra Mohan. Uh, this is a very interesting study. They, they just gave us the data uh, with uh, uh, tulium fiber raising the laser during RIRS. And now the mean stone size is 50 millimeter. And now uh, as the stone size is smaller and the expert is doing the surgery, the stone failure rate is now over 90%. But still the complication rates are high. And in this study, very interestingly, they also uh, evaluated the laser efficiency, and they find that the ablation speed uh, increases with the higher stone volume. And they say that the bigger the stone, the lesser the energy required per uh, milli cubic millimeter of the stone. So it means that if you have a big stone, it doesn't go anywhere, and you can just paint the stone much precisely with your tulium fiber laser. But of course, this requires a nice flexible uroscope as well. You need a digital scope to see, to have that good visibility. And our Russian colleagues, they have the most experience also with the tulium fiber laser as this laser originated from Russia. And in this study, Enikev and his colleagues compared the RIRS and PCNL. Uh, both of the groups were operated with the tulium fiber laser. Now, the important thing is the mean stone density in both groups is less than 900 transcript units, so they are treating the uh, softer stones here. The mean stone size is more than two centimeter, and the median laser on time is about just 10 minutes. It's really interesting. It means that the stone, the, the, they are using the high frequency settings probably because it's really very fast. And in this study, they also evaluated the difficulties in visibility. I mean, with such stone dusting with high frequency, the vision really gets blurred due to the stone dust. So, and they reported it in both RIRS and PCNL. And uh, we can see that in 14 of the RIRS cases, in three of them, there was problem with visibility. 
So to show my personal experience on that, uh, this is a study that we, this is a case that we performed endoscopic combined intraoral surgery. And this is the view from the nephroscope. And we are just doing 0.2 joules uh, with, through the flexible scope. We are trying to do the dusting. And as you can see, we have continuous flow from the sheets and still the vision is getting blurry. Although we have nice, nice dusting, it's getting blurry. <clears throat> and also another problem with TFL is it makes sometimes this stone charring. There are some black dots and then it becomes impossible to uh, make the dusting. So we just shift to the fragmentation mode and this laser is not as efficient as Holmium-Yak laser for stone fragmentation. It's better for dusting, but it's not good for fragmentation because it has a less peak power. So if you're doing a mini PCNL, in my opinion, having a Holmium-Yak laser is better, but if you're gonna do RIRS with fine dusting, then RIRS is a better option. So to conclude, first of all, uh, we should know that TFL is a novel technology. It's different from both holmium yak and tulium yak. But in my opinion, it's somehow overrated technology. It doesn't solve all of the problems of flexible ureteroscopy. It's more efficient than, than low power holmium in most of the settings, but we need comparative studies to compare it with the high power holmium yak lasers, especially with the pulse modulation, also for flexible ureteroscopy. The other one is does RIRS with TFL can replace percutaneous nephrolithotomy? I mean, TFL doesn't solve all of the problems with the RIRS because the main problem is reaching the collecting system and having a low intrarenal pressure uh, and also extraction of the residual fragments. These are all problems. And also, if you have a tight ureter or an inaccessible lower pole, then TFL again doesn't solve these problems. And again, uh, RIRS is an expensive procedure. You still need a lot of disposables uh, when you treat it retrogradely. And so what is the future of PCNL? Does TFL, does RIRS with TFL uh, replace PCNL? I can say that PCNL is here to stay. Uh, when you have uh, a huge stone burden, when you cannot access the stones with the retrograde access, uh, if you have a narrow ureter, then PCNL is the still the best option. And also it provides immediate stone clearance. You can just send the patient out of the operating room without any residual fragments with PCNL. And I guess miniaturization together with active section is the future of PCNL. But still, the final word is we should personalize our treatment options for every case. We take into account the stone related factors, the patient anatomy, and the social factors that, uh, that are included for our every individual patient. So, personalized stone approach, the PSA of endourology is uh, here to stay. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. On va prendre une seule question, si vous le permettez, parce que euh, le bloc opératoire est prêt et on va commencer la transmission. Donc une question dans la salle, just one question. Risk of injury of ureter with hypertermia with the tulium laser. And second, uh, Traxer talk about uh, searching uh, aspiration system for ureteroscopy. Mm -hmm. What about this? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, uh, as you know, the Olympus company released a notification for the thermal injury, and uh, the problem is they, the device comes up with the uh, factor settings for doing the procedures. I mean, you, we should always respect the uh, settings uh, while you, using TFL. Uh, but the uh, main idea is, I don't believe that TFL creates an extra risk for thermal injury, not in addition to whole maniac laser, because uh, what provides heat is the total watts that you use. So if you are using the same energy and same frequency, then you're gonna have the same watts for, for both holmium and tulium. So you should respect with both of the uh, lasers. If you uh, increase your uh, frequency, then you increase the watts as well. And also you may not uh, control your device very well. So it, will, it may end up with thermal injury. So the main idea is just not to go up to 10 watts in ureter 
and more than 20 fats in kidney. So if you are just below these thresholds, I don't think that there will be any problem. And if you are using high energy or high frequency, what I do in my daily practice is not to, to just use uh, irrig irrigation uh, fluids in the room temperature. The chilled irrigation can prevent it, I believe, but I don't have any data. But in my personal experience with TFL, I don't think that it doesn't cause additional thermal injury. On a à l'instant qu'il y a des problèmes de connexion avec notre ami chinois, donc euh, la porte est ouverte à plus de questions, donc euh, allez-y. More questions, uh, problem of connection. Yes. Thank you very much. May I know your opinion on use of TFF IRS in stones with the uh, what are the thousand units? Okay, so uh, actually most of our patients in Turkey also have dense stones. So uh, with the whole Nimiak laser, uh, we cannot dust these stones very efficiently. There are always some fragments scattering everywhere during our arrest, and that's the main problem. And with uh, Tolium fiber laser, it's better, you can, you, you can dust those stones better, but in the end, uh, during lithotripsy, there are, as I mentioned in the video, some black dots appear within, within inside the stone, and then it just becomes something sticky or rubbish structure, and you cannot further continue. So you need some fragmentation in the end. I mean, it doesn't really very efficiently uh, solve the problem, but maybe we can still adjust our settings. And while doing that, actually, what I could recommend is using a short pulse. With the long pulse of the tulium fiber laser, it's really, really harder to make the stone dusting. Mm -hmm. But the short pulse duration of tulium fiber laser is already so longer than that we have in home in laser. So you, you, can, you should just try to adjust your laser settings to get those stones better dusted. But it's not good for fragmentation. Mehmet, I'm sorry we just have to stop the discussion. Mm -hmm.